Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Islam in Life with me, Reza Ghazim. Donald Trump is keen to please the Zionist lobby, but would he go as far as to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of the Tel Aviv regime? People are probably thinking that he can't go that far, but people seem to have forgotten that he wasn't expected to get as far as the White House either. Donald Trump's presidency threatens to legitimize Jerusalem al-Quds as the capital city of Israel in direct contravention of the UN mandate. In 1947, UN partition plans stipulated the creation of two independent states for both Palestinians and Jews. Jerusalem al-Quds, a symbolic city for Christians, Muslims and Judaists, was to be given special international status. But Israel occupied East Jerusalem during the 1967 Six-Day War with Arab states, declaring all of the city a unified capital in 1980. Previous White House administrations never favored recognition of Jerusalem al-Quds as Israel's capital. But the shock results of the U.S. elections have fanned speculations that things might change dramatically. In the middle of his election campaign in September, Trump said Jerusalem has been the eternal capital of the Jewish people for over 3,000 years, promising to accept it as the undivided capital of Israel if he is elected. If the U.S. attempts to move its embassy to Jerusalem al-Quds, how should Muslims react? What would be the responsibility of both Muslim nations as well as individual Muslims? We're honored to be joined by our esteemed guest, Professor Tariq Ramadan, to discuss all of these issues. Welcome to the program, Professor. Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum assalam. I wanted to start off by asking, with regards to this idea of Donald Trump, is this actually, do you really think Donald Trump is going to do this and move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem? The problem with Donald Trump is that we don't exactly know what he's going to do because he's saying things and, and he's changing. And it's, uh, you know, he was saying this pleasing the Zionist uh, lobby in the States, APAC and others. Uh, but at the same time, what is true is that two things happen in Israel uh, during this period of time in, within uh, uh, the state. The first, the settlements started again and with a new project, which is to double in the, 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 the West Bank and, and over a period of five years. And it's, they said, oh, it's by coincidence, but it was after he was elected. And the second is the people uh, uh, who are supporting the idea that uh, uh, Jerusalem is the eternal capital uh, of the country are pushing that way, thinking that this is the right time to do this. So it's clear as well that in the States, uh, uh, what we had is a, a great majority of the, the, the uh, Zionist American citizens were, and the Jewish community was supporting much more Trump than Hillary Clinton, contrary to what was said at the beginning. With regards to this going on, how do you think um, that reaction is going to be, what's the reaction going to be like on the ground in Palestine, in occupied Palestine? Of course, it's going to be bad, as it has been bad with many uh, things that uh, uh, the state uh, did over the last uh, few years, always. And they have a strategy with this, is the words that they are saying is to test the international community and to test the people. But it's not only this, we think it's a strategy of testing the people to see how they are going to react, but it's also a strategy where you say something in order to uh, announce the words and then you go step by step. So this is the strategy of the fait accompli, which is it's going to be done on the ground. So I think we have to take this seriously because it has been you know, repeated by Netanyahu and before him uh, by Sharon and, and, and it's there. And the uh, uh, Western capitals and the Western governments, they keep on repeating, no, 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 it's, it's not going to happen. But yet what we see on the ground is that uh, we are moving towards this, which is more than a symbol. That's also something which is important. For the time being, it might not be the most important thing, but it's a symbol. And in terms of, if, um, for example, with the US president currently announcing this, it sounds uh, much worse than actually um, under Obama. Lots of things also continue to happen in terms of what the Israelis and what the Zionists were actually trying to do. Mm. So have things really changed with the onset of 
Donald Trump, or is it more of the same, just more in No, it's, it's more of the same, and I think that, uh, as I was saying, uh, this discussion, which is a symbol, but not uh, only a symbol, it's also the way the previous presidents were dealing with the issue and dealing with the, the, the lobbies that are supporting Israel, because we have mainly the APAC, which is coming from the Jewish community, uh, and, and the Zionists within the, the Jewish community in the United States, but you have the uh, evan uh, evangelical uh, trends within the, the country, uh, the Christians that have as an idea that the end of the world is going to happen with the presence of the, the Jewish state gathering them, which is very negative because what they think is that, that before the end of the time they're going to slaughter them all. So it is to support for them to gather as a sign of the end of uh, uh, human history and coming back to God. So these two trends are supporting. Now you can't be involved in American politics if you don't deal with the two. They are very powerful on the ground, economically speaking, financially speaking, uh, and politically speaking, and, and, and within the, all the field of economy, which is so important. So what is important there is to see that uh, even Barack Obama, who was coming and we thought that he was going to do something uh, on the issue, he had a very nice uh, uh, talk in, in Cairo about you know the Muslim majority countries and the world, but on the ground when it came to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, he did nothing. In fact, with his silence and saying it's less important, he let uh, the, 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 the governments and the successive governments to do the job of colonizing more and then also killing. We had two very bad uh, uh, summers. One time it was in summer, the other time it was in winter, where the, uh, in Gaza they were just bombarding uh, civilians and they were targeting schools and they were targeting hospitals. The American administration did nothing. What do you think Saudi Arabia will do? <laughs> I don't know. You know, the problem with the, 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 the Arab countries is that uh, they do nothing. So it might be that you, get, you end up having Saudi Arabia doing exactly the same. They move their uh, embassy to, uh, uh, to uh, Jerusalem. Uh, and it's not a joke. It's sad. It's sad. The most important uh, problems of the, uh, the most important problem that we have with the Palestinian is not coming from the West, and it's come, coming even from the, 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 the Zionists around the world. The people who let the Palestinians down are, are very often the Arab countries and the Muslim majority countries. They are not supporting. So we are here dealing with a, a, a symbol, Jerusalem, Al -Quds, Al -Al, which was Ula uh, al It was the first direction for the Muslim and the third religious place ending up having governments around the world that are not even supporting. So, so we very often say the problem of the Middle, in the Middle East is that if we uh, solve the problem, we're going to solve all the problems of the Arabs and the Muslim majority countries. But in fact, it's the other way around. We have this problem because we have so many other problems with these governments. There is no consistency, no freedom, dictatorships, and corruption. So I, I would say that uh, I am not expecting so much. Uh, from the Muslim majority countries or the Arab countries in the region, except maybe uh, some complain, but at the end they will accept. Uh, lots of interesting points that we'll pick up again. We do like to keep this show as interactive as possible and really value your opinion. Here is what you sent us this week. This week we asked, how can Muslims prevent Jerusalem Al-Quds becoming the capital of Israel? Aliyah from England said, There is a lot Muslims can do if they unite. But sadly, we are so fragmented that we won't be able to do anything significant. Karima from Pakistan said, Muslims should oppose this move in its strongest terms. U.S. Muslims should lobby their representatives and worldwide Muslims should boycott U.S. products. And Akbar from Holland said, Individual Muslims have a role to play by organizing protests and making their voices heard. But the bigger players are the Muslim nations who can stop this if they come together and stop bowing down to the United States and Israel. We have to be united against that. We have to, uh, we have to work hard. Well, Muslims should uh, do an uprising 
all over the world. Muslims should boycott all products from Israel and particularly from the occupied land. Only this way, by squeezing economically Israel, we can bend their mind. As the Muslims, yes, we have to talk about this. We, have, we shouldn't let that uh, happen. And we have to uh, unite. That, that's what we have, to, uh, we have to do, yeah. We have over one billion Muslims in the world. And if we all speak in the same voice, so we can stop that, certainly. And we could make world hear that, how important we are in the world. And uh, we can, I mean, solve all the issues as well. That's ridiculous. That's, that's, that's what people were expecting, that's, that's going to happen. But I think people uh, in the Muslim world, I think they should come out and should speak about this because that's not going to resolve the problem. It's going to give more fuel you know, towards the extremism and people already know the views about America. So I think it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to do more harm than good. I think we should carry on protesting if, if they don't think that's the right thing. Uh, and uh, I think uh, that issue has been going on for uh, many years, it's still unresolved. But uh, I think someone should take it up seriously and uh, get a resolution to that. That's all the comments we have for this week. If you'd like to have your views featured in the show, be sure to follow us on Facebook or join us on Twitter. Now you can send your own videos with your comments and even your questions to islamandlife at presstv.com. Some of the things that were being said on the clips was this idea that this needs to be opposed by ordinary Muslims. They weren't just talking about countries and so on. Um, how much mileage is there in that? It's very difficult, but still we can do things. And, and I think we, we need to understand the, the power at the grassroots level that we may have. First, as ordinary Muslims, what we have to do, ordinary citizens, by the way, is just to, to be vocal and to criticize this and to say what is uh, uh, the, the wrong and the unjust uh, uh, repression that we have there. And also to call upon you know, other voices in the world, because I was myself in uh, uh, Rome and I met with the Christians. It's very important for them to be involved with, with the Muslims, because it's not a Muslim uh, uh, issue, it's, it's an international issue. Uh, it's, a, it's a global regional conflict, but it's global. So we need the people and so we need to have our uh, Christian and uh, uh, Buddhist and Hindu friends and, and, and being part, and even Jewish, that I have some uh, Jewish friends that are completely opposed to what the government is doing and the way the repression is uh, uh, taking place on, on the ground. So we need to have some, something like an alliance of people and the citizens and, 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 and people coming from uh, different backgrounds. The second thing which is important is also to get a sense of what was done also in South Africa. In South Africa with the apartheid regime, what we did, and I was involved in this, supporting uh, the resistance of the black people there. It's uh, uh, boycotting and uh, what was important is, is the sanctions that we were supporting. It came as something which was very marginal at the beginning, as if these are citizens, but the states were against it. Of course, Israel was supporting the apartheid regime and so many uh, European countries. But at the end, with this pressure, it has an impact. So we had a campaign for BDS, uh, you know, boycott, divest, and sanction, which is something that we need to think about. It means that for every one of us, just check what you eat check what you drink, check what you buy, in order to be clear that you are not going to support such a, a, a regime and, and, and this repression. And in terms of this idea of, uh, which was again mentioned in the uh, comments that, were, that we had, was this idea of sanctions, um, because it was talking about um, targeting sanctions at the US, um, and it's about thinking through where the sanctions would actually work. The source of the problem is actually um, what the Zionist entity is actually doing within the Middle East. So where would you say the sanctions should be targeted? Because it's very, it becomes very broad and very difficult to Yes, manage. you are right. It's, it's, it could be very broad, so we have to be quite uh, 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 clear about that. First, there are some symbols that are important. When it comes to, for example, you know, the days that we are eating and things like this, we have to avoid all this. So these are symbols because it's coming out of the uh, production and the agriculture that they have and they are producing things. Who, who has? 
the, 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 the Israeli, what they are doing, and they are spreading this, and they are even changing, you know, the, uh, uh, for us to make it impossible to trace from where the products are coming. And it, has, it was even done with the authorization of the EU by saying we don't want to know. So, so, and there was resistance on saying, no, that's not right. So we have the right to know what we are eating and from where it comes and to decide if we want or not uh, eat what you are proposing. So this is for even uh, a problem with, with the, the, the freedom of the, uh, uh, the, the, the people that to decide what they want to eat or not. So we need to have here something which has to do with uh, everything which is produced and, and what we eat. And then there are symbolic uh, uh, brands that we know what we, we, we can avoid. And then uh, what is also uh, important is anything which has to do, for example, there was a big question uh, about do we have to support, you know, intellectual boycott and, and boycotting universities and some are saying no, this is freedom of expression. Uh, I would say we have to, to say that what we are seeing from the intellectuals and from the professors towards the government is not very much clear on supporting justice and resisting uh, oppression. So we would like to see much more uh, uh, teachers, professors and intellectuals uh, being vocal on this. So we can find a, a space where the cultural and the intellectual boycott is also something which is important. And then there are the transnational corporation when it comes to you know the production, the scientific production, what is done there we also have to deal with this because this is where the, the money is and the power uh, uh, remains. Now, in terms of these boycotts and putting this up, um, there is also um, this idea that the ordinary person, uh, how can they feel empowered? That's one way of empowering. Um, but how else, is there anything else that they could actually do within this context? I think that there is something which has to do with their own information, their own knowledge. So, so they need to be uh, knowledgeable. So I would say if you want to get some power on the issue, just get the, the, the power of knowledge first, because many, they don't know what is happening. They don't know the figures. They don't know what is happening on the ground. So I think to get some knowledge, to be informed. The second is to be vocal. And in fact, what uh, I keep on repeating is uh, uh, the, the, the rates and the figures. You know, in 67, after the war, uh, which was a catastrophe over there, you know, 73% of the, the, uh, the European people were supporting Israel. Now it's the other way around. Now you have more than 67% of the Europeans supporting Palestinians, because they're so, because, because we also now, as citizens, we are here to speak out and to say, look, that's, that's the, the are lying and what is happening it's unacceptable so I think that we need to be uh, informed we need to inform uh, we need to take some of the steps that we were talking about when it comes to the boycott we have to talk to our own governments it's not you know all the discussion that we have with people going to Syria they went to Bosnia and they want to go to Palestine no stay where you are as citizens and make your voice heard, make your uh, uh, presence being active in all the, 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 the topics and the, the areas where it needs, uh, uh, it needs to, be, to be heard. So it's in domestic issues, but the international issue and one of the most important uh, problems that we have in the Middle East now is the Israeli-Palestinian uh, uh, Israeli conflict. We are all talking about a very specific uh, issue in, in Syria and we are forgetting the Palestinians today and this is wrong. That's the wrong strategy. There's also an attempt to actually have this idea of um, um, uh, these boycotts and these sanctions ideas being classified as illegal and uh, something that people can't actually um, carry out. Uh, what do you think about that kind of a move? Have the, for example, the Tories, uh, the Conservative government, actually learnt from Margaret Thatcher's time as to what happened against South Africa, against the uh, will of the Tory government at the time. Yeah, and, and, and that's, it's happening in France where they made it uh, uh, illegal to boycott. How come? I, I can't decide what I'm buying and I can't decide what I'm, I don't want to support. And they make it, uh, all the campaigns are considered as illegal. And you have now trends 
for example, the Tories and, and others around Europe with a very and strong uh, uh, lobby, lobbying reality that we have on the ground uh, at different levels, from at the highest level of the state, but also at the grassroots level with Zionists that are supporting and they want to make it illegal, they want to make it uh, criminal just to boycott uh, Israel. And saying you, it means that you are against the existence of Israel, it means that you are against uh, uh, the very uh, that you are anti-Semite. This is it ends up being being this, and we have to be clear. And this is where uh, we need to understand that it's not going to be us, a very you know specific community with our religion, uh, promoting this. We we need alliances, and there are lots of people beyond the Muslim community, beyond the Christian community, beyond the the, the, the Arabs, and be who are ready to work, all the people who care about justice, this is where we have to stand and with whom we have to stand. Do sanctions work on these boycotts? It's going to be a long term. It's, it's not going to work on its own. It's not going to work like this. It's one strategy or one angle within a bigger strategy. And the strategy, it's, uh, it's political, it's uh, resistance and uh, yes you know I, I launched a, a few years ago an international uh, campaign and movement of non-violence resistance among uh, within which the, the boycott was was thought also in this but uh, we need to have different strategies and different tactics and different ways of dealing with it but boycott uh, works and and to the point that uh, if it did, if, if if it was not working, why would we have you know, all these uh, lobbies just uh, working against this and trying to criminalize the fact that we are boycotting? It means that it had an impact, and it has it had an impact with South, the, the, in, in South Africa. It, it's going to have an impact with Israel. In terms of Muslim countries, or the Muslim expectation of what a Muslim country should do in this regard. What would you ideally want? What stance would you like the, any Muslim majority country to take? Or in fact, actually, any country in the world to take? There, yeah, but I think that there are steps. Uh, I don't think that the two, you know, the two state is going to work. I, I think that this is now on the ground is not going to work. But at least from our side, we need to come back and to start by saying, look, why don't we come to the UN resolution first and start with 67 and, and just to come back to the borders and, and, and at least to start with this. You want us not to deny history and to deny the reality? Let us come to the resolutions and say, why don't we come with this? So it means that the occupied territory, the wall, everything which is illegal, you have to remove it and you have to come and to accept the resolutions. Why am I saying this? Because I know it's going, not going to happen, but our position is a powerful position if we say, look, we are ready for uh, peace and we are ready to be part of a process that is helping all the people to live. We are not saying that we want to remove the, the, the Jews. That's not the way. We want to live together. But in order to live together, you have to take a stand. You have to, do, uh, uh, to take a first step to show the people that you are ready. And as some were saying, uh, Kessel, who was an ambassador, a French ambassador, was saying, in fact, between the two, the one who doesn't want peace is the Israeli government, it's not the Palestinians. And on that note, um, most Western governments like to run a scare story about the extreme steps that they are about to take. And then what actually gets proposed is something that is not as extreme. This makes everyone breathe a sigh of relief that this is not so bad a result, considering what was proposed. Instead of even challenging that extremity, we get lulled into thinking that things actually didn't turn out bad when they did. Donald Trump and previous presidents have carried out varying colors of oppression. So we know there will be oppression, but the question is, how will the oppressed and the passers-by, like us, react? That's all the time we have for today. I would like to thank Professor Tariq Ramadan for joining us, and I thank you all for watching. Until next time, goodbye.